One of the things that often attracts people to EVs, beyond the obvious climate benefits, the decreased total cost of ownership, the lower maintenance needs, the more comfortable driving experience, the instant torque. Sorry, uh, beyond the manifold benefits over their internal combustion kin is the simplicity and reliability that's presumed to come from having an EV drivetrain. With as few as three moving parts and a relative handful of support components, most of which are entirely electronic, particularly in more integrated EVs, the motors should run for thousands of miles with little need for interventions of any sort, and the electronics should be entirely maintenance free. But several surveys over the past few years have raised concerns about the reliability of EVs. Most recently, Yule asked us to look at the WHICH survey that again reported that EVs just aren't as reliable as they should be. For non-Brit viewers, WHICH, with a question mark, is an organisation similar to the Consumer Reports organisation in the United States. It evaluates everything from toasters and towel rails to computers and cars for build quality, customer satisfaction and reliability. So this survey. Is it fear, uncertainty and doubt, or FUD, or is it something we should be concerned about? Let's dig in. But first, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell to make sure you don't miss a video from us. We publish pretty much every single day, so you can always have high quality independent journalism in your YouTube queue. Check out the end of the video or links below to find out how you can support us from under a dollar a month. Now, as long as there have been cars, there have been EVs, the electric drivetrain has always been tempting because of its general superiority over the complex and challenging requirements of the fossil fuel burner, but until recently battery technology has lagged behind. As electric vehicles have finally re-entered the mass market, we've seen the EV go rapidly from hand-built, bespoke and small volume cars to suddenly being placed front and centre in mainstream automotive lineups. And at the heart of these vehicles is technology that pushes the boundaries of what we can technically achieve, in ways that are more typically found in high-end computing. I'm old enough to remember when folks in Britain didn't buy televisions, they rented them. Not just because of the expense, but also because you'd have an engineer around every few months to come and fix the new and interesting fault that the set had developed. And renting meant the endless engineer visits were covered by the rental company. In fact, with my own first colour TV, a Mark II Ferguson colour star for you vintage TV geeks, I spent almost as much time with the back off fixing the damn thing as I did watching the front. The librarians knew me by sight and had the repair manual almost permanently out, just for me. There are a lot of reasons that it spent so much time being repaired. Many of the components were running at or near their limits, which meant they ran hot, which shortened their lifespan. But also, and a hat tip here to Donald Norman's design of everyday things, complex systems, like TVs, have to contend with being used outside their original design specifications, by people who don't necessarily use them in the way the designers envisaged, in environments that weren't foreseen, and they have to interact with systems that existed either before or after they were created. Or, as Cory Doctrow puts it, everything is always broken. So is this the case for modern EVs? Well, let's first look at that which article that prompted this video. That's available free of charge on its website. It states that the survey included 48,000 respondents and covers 56,853 cars, up to four years old. Now, it's possible that there's a response bias here, that people who experience problems are more likely to complain, and we should always bear that in mind when looking at survey data. But ignoring that, let's take a look at what which chose as headline numbers. The big headline grabber indicates that 31.4% of EV owners experienced, quote, a fault in the last year. Now, this seems to be pretty broadly defined because the article mentions that software problems rather than hardware problems made up the majority of these. More concerning is that 8.1% of EV owners experienced a failure to start from their cars, which could be something as simple as a flat 12 volt battery or a flat key fob battery, or it could be something much more troublesome. Bear in mind that it's surveying owners, not individual cars, and what proportion of EV owners have more than one. 
I know that once we got one, we were really keen to replace our remaining gas burner with a second electron sipper. So let's be blunt though, those numbers sound bad. Not obsidian order dropping around to check up on you bad, but bad nonetheless. But as we all know, there are lies, damn lies and statistics. So the million dollar question is, is the which article a good representation of the survey data? First up, we contacted which magazine. I asked about sample sizes both in general and for each brand, and also what statistical analysis was performed on the calculations in the survey to make sure that the results were valid. This is particularly important because if EVs made up a small part of the sample, then a small difference in reliability might look bad in raw numbers, but actually not turn out to be something that would still be true with more data. And being excited because a model shows super reliability because 100% of them worked perfectly may be disappointing if there's only one of them in the sample set. Now it's not uncommon, as with consumer reports in the US, that an organisation doesn't reveal figures that are gathered, quote, for their subscribers, and that was the case here. Although which actually went further and asked us to refrain from reporting on the article, published for free on its website, which is not how any of this works. So let's see if we can rough out some numbers to work with and see what's going on with the information that we do have. EV sales in the UK have shot up dramatically over the past few years, as they have in many places, going from 0.7% back in 2018 up to 11.6% in 2021, and then again to nearly 20% in January of this year. At the same time, however, the number of new cars registered per year has fallen from nearly 2.5 million in 2017 down to 1.6 million in 2021. Using a lazy average of approximately 5% of new cars sold being EVs, which is probably erring far too far on the high side, that means that in the survey there were probably at most 2,500 EVs. That's assuming that which subscribers and respondents bought new cars at the same rate as the average UK purchaser. I'm going to hazard a guess that which buyers may be more cautious given their choice of reading matter and that might reduce the likelihood of taking the leap on a new technology. That said, which consumers might be more affluent and thus more able to afford an EV? So it really is back of the envelope maths. But even with those generous assumptions, it's still a pretty small sample size. And from that, the survey states that the average percentage of vehicles that had some kind of a fault that might be anything from a warning light up to, say, going on a murderous rampage because you dissed its shiny red paintwork, that the average fault rate for EVs is 31%. But the illustrious Kia Nero EV, or e-Nero in Europe, only had a fault rate of 6%. That suggests a massive variance in the results. And with massive variance comes the problem of what is significant. And I've spent an hour or two playing with the figures I can pull since we don't have access to the raw data, and with no answer from which about what statistical analysis they performed, all I can say is there might or might not be something here. And I'm not saying that just because I own a Nero, which is, on which's data, only marginally more likely to have any kind of fault than the very best of gas car. But this isn't the first survey to suggest that automakers are struggling with the transition, or in Tesla's case, the ramp up to producing large numbers of EVs. Consumer Reports has dinged the bolt for reliability on its drivetrain and in-car electronics, and it incurred the wrath of Tesla stands for removing its coveted recommendation following issues with Tesla's in-car electrics, body trim, and structure. So that could be issues like Tesla's problems with early iterations of its in-car screen on the Model S, or it could be trim braking or poorly fitting or just rattles and squeaks, which could track back to the trim. At this point, it's probably good to note that if you've driven an EV, you'll know how much quieter they are and thus how much more obvious any kind of squeak or rattle from loose trim can be. If you're including noise from trim as a fault, then EVs are encumbered with solving a much more difficult problem from the get-go. Add to that the fact that many EVs on sale at the moment, particularly from legacy automakers, are the first vehicles on brand new platforms, often in their first year of volume manufacturing. Any car fan will tell you that the first year of vehicle production can be a little rough. 
But all that said, the most reliable gasoline SUV in the US gets a score of 90 in Consumer Reports, rather opaque total score, and in contrast, the highest scoring EV, I'm afraid that honour goes to the Nero EV again, I'm sorry all you folks who just don't have the best EV, that gets a score of 88. Hardly a massive difference. And in the What Car survey, that one's back over in the UK, if you put the first generation Leaf into the family car category, it had come second out of all vehicles on reliability, scoring an impressive 98.6%. Even the cheaper MG ZS EV puts in a very respectable 96.5% reliability. But again, the entire group surveyed was 12,000 people. By the time you've divvied up this population into EV owners and then specific brands, this is most likely an electron microscope sized sample created with beam epitaxy. Incidentally, from that what car survey, if you want 100% reliability, you're gonna really have to splash out. It's the ultimate in luxury. The Dacia Sandero. That's what's top of the reliability tree there, scoring a 100% reliability. I do wonder if there was just one car repping the entire model there. So to what extent is the Witch survey a real representation of a problem in the EV industry? It's unclear, particularly with Witch not sharing some of the most important information about its survey. It does seem likely that there's room for improvement though, but regardless of where we end up finding out that the current crop of EVs sit in terms of reliability, when we actually have enough data, one thing that's consistent across all the surveys is that EV owners are more satisfied with their purchases. Owning an EV in general is a much better experience than owning a gas car, so while there might be work to do trying to move us from the bleeding edge of technology to the recliner of reliability? Sorry, we'll just have to wait for some actual numbers to come in to work out how much of an improvement we need to make. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back with more soon. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link below. If you haven't already, make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right. They are our 15 to 49 dollar a month supporters. Special thanks to our 50 dollar a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tessa in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Zachary Courtney, Chris Center, and Denny High. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylon, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Want your name on that list? You can join our Patreon at the link below, support us using the YouTube Join button, or show us your love through Bitcoin Kofi or our cool swag store. Links are lurking right down there. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!